It was a major setback to the cause of international justice. When the president of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir, attended a summit in South Africa in June of 2015, he managed to get out of the country despite a court order banning him from leaving because of an outstanding warrant for his arrest on charges of war crimes and crimes against humanity. South Africa's government did nothing to prevent his escape. The warrant had been issued by this official, Fatou Ben Souda, the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. It is here in her office in The Hague that she and her team of analysts and investigators try to bring those responsible for the most heinous crimes to justice. It is a seemingly endless process. What motivates us always to have that opportunity to give a voice to the victims. But is it making any difference? Critics say the court has had such little impact that it is in danger of becoming obsolete. Others point to the move just last week by the Palestinians to bring charges of war crimes against the Israeli government as an example of how vital the ICC can still be. We'll explore all of this as the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court talks to Al Jazeera. Madam Prosecutor, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Let's tackle a couple of issues involving the ICC that have been making the headlines in the last couple of weeks. The, the Palestinians have brought to you their documents alleging war crimes committed, they say, by Israel. What is the stage of your investigation into that? I think firstly I would like to say that it is not an investigation yet. Um, it is a preliminary examination. And during this phase, we're trying to um, collect information from all sides, reliable, credible information to be provided to my office to um, analyze that information in, the, in an independent and impartial way and, uh, make and look for certain criteria that has to be met, have to be met under the Rome Statute, such as um, subject matter jurisdiction, are these ICC crimes? Um, are there any national proceedings ongoing? Um, what are the gravity of those crimes that will warrant the intervention of the ICC? Will it be against the interest of justice if ICC were to intervene? The Palestinians have handed you their dossier of what they say is evidence. What have you got from the Israelis? Um, we do not have anything yet from the Israelis. Um, we have, however, I've been very clear from the very beginning that I'm encouraging all parties to the conflict to provide my, my office You've with asked information. them for information. You've asked the Israelis for information? I have asked Israelis. I've also asked for the Palestinians. I've asked, as I said, that all parties to the con conflict should cooperate with my office how and many, provide us with information. How many times have you asked the Israelis to help you in this? Well, um, obviously... Uh, More than once? Let me put it this way. As I said, in all my public statements, that my office can only um, uh, proceed with our preliminary analysis and examinations if we are able to get information that will help us make uh, a determination or not or on whether to uh, proceed to an investigation. And not a single thing from the Israelis? Not even we won't provide you with information, just silence? Not yet, but we hope that, I do hope that uh, the Israelis will provide my office with information. So what would you say to the authorities, to Benjamin Netanyahu in particular at this moment, the Palestinians having handed over what they say is their evidence, what would you say to the Prime Minister of Israel? I will still continue what I said from the very beginning, that I am encouraging everyone, all sides to the conflict, to provide my office with uh, information. It is a phase that I need information to be able to make a determination. You see, the Israelis reason. say that... Um, there's no reason for them to cooperate because Palestine is not a state. The issue of uh, statehood has uh, never been um, something that my office was uh, using as a determination to, to intervene or not. It's, it's not, not been the reason why uh, we have decided to open preliminary examination or not. The 
our, we have been very consistent in saying that um, Palestine, the status of Palestine at the United Nations is what has determined for us whether we should open preliminary examination or not. Are you, as has been widely reported, planning to send either in the next week or next couple of weeks or whenever a team of investigators to Israel and Palestine to try and find out for yourselves, even without the cooperation of the Israeli authorities? Um, preliminary examination is really about collecting information, getting information. And like I do in all the situations where I have opened preliminary examination, I do send, sometimes I even visit myself, but I do send my team of investigators, and I wouldn't call them investigators even, the situation analysis section, whose role is really to collect information and to able to come and quietly assess that information. So we have requested to all sides for a visit, as I said, within the context of the preliminary examination, and no date has been fixed yet. No date has been but fixed. But you will go with or without the, the say-so of the Israeli authorities? This is what has been reported. Well, we have requested, as I said, from both the Palestinians and the Israelis to be able to deploy to the field to collect information. Let me be clear about your position on this one. You've asked, you've asked time and time again, you yeah, say, yeah. to the authorities there. Uh, there ca has to come a point when you say, we can't ask any longer, we have to go and do it. Are, are you in that position now? Information, as I said, uh, is crucial for my office, especially uh, in the context that the prelim preliminary examination has to move on. I have made requests already, as I said, to all sides, even this afternoon, this was discussed, and we have not yet got any response but I hope to be able to deploy to the field as soon as possible, my team. Because I repeat something that you said a couple of weeks ago. Um, if it does not cooperate with an initial investigation, the court may launch a full investigation without its input. That's a possibility, isn't it? I do not think that I've, talk, I've said about full investigations because we are really not investigating at the moment. It is, a, it is conducting, we are conducting a preliminary examination and collecting information for that purpose. I understand that, but what, what the Associated Press is quoting you as saying is if you don't get the cooperation, mm -hmm. you may launch a full investigation with or without Israel's cooperation. The launching of full investigations does not depend on whether there is cooperation at the preliminary analysis phase or not. I just want things to be clear. What, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is I need information and if I have that information, it's very good for me, from all sides. If I don't have the information from all sides, I will just be forced to go with what I have. But it has to be clear that it doesn't mean if I do not have the cooperation, the preliminary examinations will not go on. Let's move to another headline-making incident involving the ICC, that of the arrival in South Africa of the President of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir, for an African Union summit. His arrest was asked for by the ICC. A court said, you can't leave South Africa, and yet either the ruling party, the ANC, or the South African government ignored your request, mm -hmm. despite being a party to the International Criminal Court. You must have been furious at that. I was very disappointed, and I'm sure that many people who care for justice for the victims of these alleged crimes would also have been very disappointed, especially the victims of the crimes themselves. Um, the, I'm sure also the uh, international community was quite also disappointed about uh, the um, unwillingness of South Africa to effect the arrest. And this, the, the, the obligation of South Africa, as in the 123 states parties who have signed and ratified the Rome Statute, the obligation to arrest and surrender once a suspect finds themselves on the territory of a state party is quite clear. And I believe that in this particular case, there was no ambiguity, that it was very clear that the obligations of South Africa under the Rome Statute that it is a party to was really clear, and that what they had to do was to arrest and surrender Omar al-Bashir to the ICC. But this was a member of the ICC 
making a mockery of mm -hmm. its position within uh, that jurisdiction, effectively sort of thumbing its nose at, at your, your body and saying we can do what we want. In fact, the ICC is totally irrelevant. Yeah. I believe the, this obligation that uh, South Africa has is, is one that is uh, imposed upon, that it has imposed upon itself by being signing and ratifying the Rome Statute. And but what it, does it say about what South Africa thinks of the ICC? Well, I, I think you need to also look into what actually happened and uh, how the courts have reacted. This is something positive that has come out of all this. The courts, the High Court in, in South Africa has determined that the action of South Africa by re releasing or letting President al-Bashir leave is unconstitutional. Doesn't affect but the outcome and South Africa is now saying we may well leave the International Criminal Court. You know, being part of the International Criminal Court and uh, not being part of the International Criminal Court, I always say, it's a sovereign decision. Um, and it's, an, it's also an obligation that once you sign and ratify, this obligation rests on you. How the country that has uh, decided to respect its own obligations is, uh, is really a matter that South Africa itself has to look at closely. But what would well, it South, say about South the organization as a whole if South Africa, one of the leading countries on that continent, mm -hmm. the country that welcomed your appointment as chief prosecutor, mm -hmm. if it pulled out mm -hmm. of the International Criminal Court, what would it say for the court's credibility on that continent? I don't think it's a matter of the court's credibility. When it comes to the credibility of the court, I believe it has been established already. And this, is, uh, this has been demonstrated amply already on the continent and elsewhere as, uh, because of the several calls that is being called upon by the international community and areas on conflict, in conflict for the intervention by the ICC, whether it is in South Sudan, where we don't have jurisdiction, whether it is in Syria, whether it is in Iraq. So really, the credibility of the International Criminal Court has already been established. The relevance of the International Criminal Court has already been established. Now, when states who have a clear and um, an ambiguous obligation under the Rome Statute to, to accept and to implement those oblig obligations don't do it, I do not think it is for the, it is a, anything to do with the credibility of the ICC, but with the seriousness of which states take their obligations but under the Rome Statute. A lot of people will be watching this and saying, how is it possible for you to say that um, the disregard that a lot of countries in Africa appear to have now for the International Criminal Court does not affect its effectiveness mm -hmm. or its credibility mm -hmm. or its relevance when mm -hmm. the African Union is effectively saying it's no longer relevant to what we do when one of the leading countries is saying we may well pull out of it. How can you sit there and say this doesn't affect what I do? I, I would say this, and, and absolutely I will defend it any day. Um, we look at what is happening at the political level, all the political posturing that is being taken against the ICC. But when you come to practical, the ICC's work in the continent, the ICC's cooperation that it receives from individual African states. We didn't get much cooperation from South Africa. We did not, but we do get cooperation uh, from other African states. In the case of South Africa, you will recall that uh, um, there were two invitations uh, previously which uh, um, South Africa had made to President Bashir, but at the same time warned that there is possibility of arrest, which I, I believe stopped President al-Bashir from visiting. This has come as quite a surprise, this move by uh, South Africa, and I believe, as they have been consistently saying, that is because the African Union does not want to cooperate with the ICC on the arrest of Bashir, and therefore the, um, the, the South Africa wishes to go down that road. But as I said, let us look at practically what is happening. Let me ask Our, you. If, okay. Please, please carry on. Yeah. If you, if you look at what is happening on the ground with respect to our individual cooperation with African states. We are constantly making requests for assistance to these states. And we are, I can say, almost 90%
of those requests are positive. And these are African states. And you also need to remember that over two thirds of the, of the African continent, 34 out of 54 African states are part of the ICC. And you should also recall the role that Africa has played in the establishment of the International Criminal Court. You see, this is one of the criticisms, isn't it? That it is Africa, 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 mm -hmm. as far as the ICC is concerned. Mm -hmm. you, you say you get great cooperation, but an awful lot of your requests go to African countries. Mm -hmm. Tell our viewers mm -hmm. how many people from outside the continent of Africa have been indicted by the International Criminal Court. Um, let me tell you about the situations. Can uh, I just get an answer to that one? First of all, none, none have been indicted. None How many? Have been, none. No, no one has been indicted yet. And I want to be clear on that. That's well, why I started. Why is that? It's a matter of jurisdiction, simply put. It's just a matter of jurisdiction. And also, I want us to just step back and look at how the cases that we have in Africa got to the ICC. This is very important. This is historical. I would like you perhaps to try and look forward. Mm -hmm. In your new tenure as yes. the chief prosecutor, you've been doing the job three years now, mm -hmm. uh, you were elected with a great deal of support from African countries. Yes. They at the time said it was shameful. Mm -hmm. this, this cry has continued that most of the prosecution seemed to be involving African countries. Mm -hmm. Why aren't you looking outside? I took a look at your map. And, and it shows maybe a little bit of an investigation mm -hmm. here in Afghanistan, maybe an investigation, uh, an examination perhaps, yep. in Korea, etc., yep. Honduras. Mm -hmm. But you say not a single person from outside the continent of Africa. Isn't yes. that shameful? I don't think so. It is not shameful. And, uh, but crimes aren't only committed in Africa. Indeed. And uh, if you will um, allow me, I will explain to you that uh, it is a matter of jurisdiction. And I want uh, this to be very clear. We are outside of Africa. We have preliminary examinations. We have open preliminary examinations, um, as you have rightly said, in uh, Afghanistan, in Georgia, in Ukraine, in Honduras, in Palestine. These preliminary examinations, as I explained earlier on, it's a phase. It's a phase in which, at the end of that phase, a determination is made whether to open investigations, which will eventually probably lead to someone or the other being charged. And I just want to be clear here that I will not hesitate to open investigations in any of those situations where the criteria under the Rome Statute is met. Let me ask you about this Rome Statute business because we invited uh, people on our social media sites to send in their questions mm -hmm. for you. And, and, and a recurrent theme was if there are people you can target, uh, why not go after people like George Bush? Or, or Tony Blair, for their part in, in the wars in the Middle East, for example. Is that simply a matter of jurisdiction? Or is it because the United States isn't a signatory? It is. A, that's, that's what brings our jurisdiction into, uh, into play. And I said it's all a matter of jurisdiction. But the UK ICC, is a member of the ICC. I, I, I can address that. ICC can intervene only on the territory of state parties or over the national of state parties. And when the, the criticism comes that why are you not in Syria, the answer is very simple. Syria is not a state party. Why are you not investigating in Iraq? Again, the answer is very simple. Iraq is not a state party. However, you mentioned the UK. And I just want to draw attention to the fact that I have opened preliminary examinations over in, the, in, in Iraq over the UK soldiers who were involved in the conflict, the UK Defense Forces, for the allegations of torture that took place in Iraq but during the conflict. you could after the leader of the country, Tony Blair, in this instance? It is, a, it is a preliminary examination, as I said. When we open preliminary examination, it has to be clear. We do not go and target people. We have to look at the situation. We have to look at what we have. And then from there, it, uh, it, we either op when we open, and investigations and collect the evidence, it is that evidence that will lead us to the individual to be charged. This is how we proceed. And this has to be clear uh, in people's minds that we do not just go after people. Our jurisdiction is very important. I exercise my mandate based on the Rome Statute. There are legal criterias that, criteria that is in the Rome Statute that I have to go by. 
And this has to be understood. We are not going after Bush, as people uh, choose to call it, because America is not a state party to the Rome Statute. They do tell us that um, their involvement in Iraq, why is uh, ICC not going after Bush? Iraq is not a state party. America is not a state party. And that is why I'm explaining with respect to the UK, because it is a state party, and the, the therefore the nationals, the uh, are nationals of a state party, the ICC only has jurisdiction over the nationals of state parties. Let me ask you another point that was put to us by our users of, of social media concerning events in Kenya. Uh, to summarize, yeah. the, the sentiment was, why did you let the president of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta, go? Um, <clears throat> I first of all will say that uh, that is an unfair question first because it's not a question of letting Mr. Kenyatta go. I believe that it is uh, the history of this case before the court and the situation in Kenya before the uh, ICC has been very clear. I've been very transparent in explaining what has happened to the case. You will recall that this case was brought for confirmation before the judges of the ICC, independent judges of the ICC, this case was presented to them for confirmation. And the charges against Mr. Kenyatta were confirmed. Uh, was, there, was there witness intimidation and as has been suggested that I, people were afraid to come before I believe the court? I've been very loud and clear about this. I have explained, uh, um, this is what I was coming to. The evidence that we had at the confirmation of charges hearing had been so eroded due to witness interference, witness intimidation, bribery, that the evidence would no longer um, stand, would stand the test that we need before the judges. And that test is beyond reasonable doubt. Um, in 2013, I had gone before the judges of the ICC to explain that my witnesses are being interfered with. I'm also having lack of cooperation in the Kenya situation, unfortunately. And I asked for time to be able to see if that, those evidence that I, I was missing, we could get it somehow. Unfortunately, when I went back before the judges of the ICC last year, it was still the same situation. Witnesses were unwilling to come forward. Those who were with us, who were Giving, the, giving my case some uh, very credible evidence, especially with regard to linkage, have decided to leave the case. They would not want to be witnesses anymore. And as a result, I went there, which I, I believe any responsible prosecutor should do. I went back to the judges and explained to the judges that my evidence is not in a state that I can comfortably and responsibly as a prosecutor go before the judges to bring the case. Let me ask you about the value for money. $166 million a year, there or thereabouts. Your, your budget has been increased. Some people say that there's not much you can do mm -hmm. with that sort of money. Others say, fantastic that we have an international criminal court, but I'll quote you this from um, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. If the ICC is unable to deal with new situations because of lack of money, mm -hmm. due to a lack of resources, it risks becoming obsolete. Now mm -hmm. that's the view of an organization that broadly welcomed, in fact hugely welcomed the creation of the court um, in 2002. Mm -hmm. This just emphasizes the importance of the ICC having the resources that it needs to be able to perform its, uh, its work. Obsolete is yeah. the word they use. I, I, do, I do know that. Um, what we need, to do one case, uh, which maybe it was a couple of years ago, and you see now what the ICC, the Office of the Prosecutor, is dealing with, what the court is dealing with, you will realize that um, the resources that we need is not really matching the demands of the office. And we are constantly making this known to this Assembly of States parties that for this court, that today, 123 states have signed and ratified. If we do not have the resources, we will not be able to be as effective as we should be. Madam Prosecutor, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.